Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the 2017-2018 Lectures in Catholic Experience. And I want to extend a special welcome to any of you who might be here at St. Charles University for the first time. Very happy to have you with us this evening. I want to begin the evening by acknowledging that we are on the traditional territory of the neutral Anishinaabe and Haudenosaunee peoples. The university is situated on the Haldeman Track, the land promised to the Six Nations that includes six miles on each side of the Grand River. My name is Christina Vanine. I'm the Associate Dean here at St. Jerome's University, and I coordinate the lecture series. Before we actually get started, if you could just make sure that whatever electronic devices you have with you are on some kind of um, status so that they don't make any noise for the rest of us, that would be great. Thank you. In his book, Word and Image, Father Michael Patella tells us that it was back in 1996 that the monastic community at St. John's Abbey in Collegeville, Minnesota, pondered how they might mark the coming of the new millennium. The community wanted something that could draw on the 1,500-year-old Benedictine tradition while simultaneously enlivening the Christian tradition. The idea of sponsoring a handwritten and illuminated Bible seemed to fit both criteria. And the monks of St. John's hoped that this project could reignite the fires of artistic imagination. One of the biggest tasks for the community at St. John's was to make clear why in an age when even the commercial printing press is facing an uncertain future, why would anyone want to embark on a project using vellum, ink, goose quills to produce something that could be obtained by the click of a button? The community identified six things that they hoped for this project. They wanted the St. John's Bible to glorify God's word, to give voice to the unprivileged, to ignite imagination, to revive tradition, to discover history, and to foster the arts. The Most Reverend Rowan Williams, former Archbishop of Canterbury, expresses the value of this St. John's Bible project in this way. We tend to read greedily and hastily as we do so many other things. This beautiful text shows us a better way. This project not only revives the ancient tradition of the church sponsoring creative arts, it also offers an insight into that lost skill of patient and prayerful reading. This evening, we are fortunate to have with us Dr. Lisa Fagan Davis to help us to understand this long tradition of writing the Bible by hand. Lisa received a PhD in Medieval Studies from Yale University in 1993. She has cataloged medieval and Renaissance manuscript collections throughout the United States and has published five books and numerous articles in this field. The Boston Globe tells about some of the unexpected places where Dr. Davis has found medieval manuscripts. In Reno, she found a 15th century French prayer book with gold leaf that was once owned by a Welsh actor turned missionary. In South Dakota, she discovered a 600 year old leaf from another book with a prayer meditating on the final seven statements uttered by Jesus. And in Boulder, Colorado, she found a rare image of the martyrdom of St. Eustace, who was boiled in a hollow bronze idol shaped like a calf. In 2016, Dr. Davis co-curated the major exhibition Beyond Words, Illuminated Manuscripts in Boston Collections. And this exhi exhibition was at the Houghton Library at Harvard University, the McMullen Museum of Art at Boston College, and the Isabella Stewart Gardner Museum. In addition to serving as executive director of the Medieval Academy of America, she regularly teaches an introduction to manuscript studies at the Simmons College Graduate School of Library and Information Science. 
Please join me in welcoming Dr. Lisa Fagan Davis to speak to us on the topic, Writing the Bible, from 7th century Northumberland to 21st century Minnesota. Dr. Davis. Thank you so much for that lovely introduction, and thank you to your president and to Professor Bednarski and your students uh, for this very warm welcome. I hope you all take the opportunity to visit the exhibition outside of manuscript facsimiles and also of um, the actual St. John's Bible. There's a volume uh, right outside as well that uh, you should definitely take a few minutes to uh, take a look at. All right, let's see if this is going to work. There we go, excellent. The St. John's Bible, of which this is the first page, represents a There we go. All right. Is that better now? There we go. Now I think we're good. Can everyone hear me all right? Yes? Okay. The St. John's Bible represents an extraordinary... A handwritten manuscript of the Bible in English, produced in 21st century Wales and in Minnesota. The St. John's Bible, there it is, represents an extraordinary achievement. A handwritten manuscript of the Bible in English produced in 21st century Wales and Minnesota. Beautifully illuminated, skillfully written in seven magnificent volumes. But the tradition of writing the Bible by hand reaches back 2,000 years to the earliest fragments of the Dead Sea Scrolls. In particular, the model for the St. John's Bible grows out of the Western monastic tradition established by Benedictine monks in Northumberland in Ireland after the retreat of the Romans and exported to the European continent in the early Middle Ages. As we follow the development of this model over the course of a thousand years, we will observe how geopolitics, literacy, and liturgical practice directly impacted the format, size, illustration, and content of the handwritten Bible. First, a little context. Medieval and Renaissance manuscripts represent the largest surviving body of evidence for every aspect of intellectual history in Europe from the 4th to the 16th centuries. In them are preserved extraordinary images and often unique texts of importance to scholars in many disciplines, including classics, comparative literature, history, language, and so on, as well as the history of business, law, medicine, and science. In fact, pre-1600 manuscripts are the primary resources for the study of every aspect of intellectual, spiritual, and artistic life in the Middle Ages and Renaissance on the continent of Europe. You can observe the development not only of the book arts, but of literature, of music, science, and commerce, all by studying the history of the book, and even by studying the history of a single book, the Bible. Bibles were often designed for procession and display as sacred ceremonial objects. They weren't just books to be read. And so the grandest Bibles preserved some of the greatest art of the Middle Ages. Illuminated with real gold, sparkling and glowing, they are stunning works of sacred beauty. It is easy to understand why they inspired divine awe and reverence. Throughout what follows, it is extremely important to remember that we are talking about handmade books, not books that were mechanically printed. The word manuscript literally means written by hand. Every aspect of a medieval manuscript, from preparing the parchment and ink and quill to writing and illustrating and sewing and binding, was done by a human being, by a craftsperson. Each manuscript, therefore, is completely and utterly unique representing a significant investment of time and resources. There are other implications, of course. Human beings are, by nature, imperfect. And every manuscript includes textual errors of some kind. These errors can help scholars determine how different copies of a particular text are related to one another. In biblical scholarship, transmission errors in the earliest manuscripts can have major theological implications. Now, people tend to think of the Middle Ages as one long, dark, homogenous millennium during which nothing changed, nothing happened, nothing progressed, and everyone was just sitting around in the mud, biding their time, waiting for the Renaissance to arrive so they could start painting. <laughs> now, as works such as these clearly demonstrate, that perception is simply not so. 
Our story begins way back in the year 312 AD, when the Roman Emperor Constantine saw a vision of a crucifix in the sky and was inspired to convert to Christianity. Sixty-eight years later, Emperor Theodosius officially made Christianity the state religion of the Roman Empire. At that time, the Roman Empire was massive, stretching from what is now Syria in the east all the way around the Mediterranean through Western Europe, essentially as far as the Scottish border. Not, you'll notice, in the upper left corner there, into what is now Scotland and Ireland. This is a very important detail, so keep it in mind for a few minutes. The division of the empire into east and west, followed by the sack of Rome by the Visigoths in the year 410, combined to bring about the end of this massive era of the Roman Empire. In the middle of this geopolitical turmoil, we are told, the Bible was first translated from Greek into Latin and uh, Aramaic into Latin by this institution's patron, St. Jerome. Technically, Jerome's Latin wasn't the first Latin, but it was a significant improvement over the slightly earlier version known as the Old Latin, like the year 400 isn't old enough. I could not help noticing, of course, that the arms of St. Jerome's University includes a lion at the top. This is quite appropriate, as St. Jerome is usually depicted in medieval art with his saintly attribute, a lion. As you look at these, you may wonder if anyone in the Middle Ages had ever actually seen a lion. <laughs> the one in the lower left is my absolute favorite. St. Jerome was born in Dalmatia around the year 347 and died in Bethlehem in the year 420. He is known as one of the four Latin fathers of the church, alongside Saints Augustine, Ambrose, and Gregory the Great. He spent four years in the desert, in the Syrian desert, as a hermit, mortifying his flesh and elevating his spirit through study and meditation. Legend tells us that he once encountered a lion with a thorn in its paw, as you see in the lower left corner. His kindness in tending to the lion proved him to be a man of good character who loved God's creatures. And so he was rewarded with a vision of Christ on the cross. Because of this episode, he became associated with a lion in art. And even when he is depicted at work in his study, the lion is rarely far away. <laughs> Jerome's work established the Latin text of the Bible known as the Vulgate, work that would endure for a thousand years. During the tumultuous centuries that followed the division and defeat of the Roman Empire in the fifth century, Christianity continued to slowly spread throughout Europe by means of Catholic missionaries sent by the Pope in Rome. This is the period often, but erroneously, called the Dark Ages. Don't ever use that term around me. It was a time of recovery, certainly, but hardly bereft of beauty and learning, as we will see. The light stayed on in Rome, certainly, but also in the outer reaches of the British Isles, where monks in Irish and northern abbeys continued to create exquisite works of art in handwritten books. When Pope Gregory the Great sent a monk named Augustine, not the Saint Augustine of Hippo, but a different Augustine, to Britain in the year 597 to convert the Anglo-Saxons, that monk is said to have brought with him a manuscript now known as the Gospels of Saint Augustine. This sixth century gospel book now belongs to Corpus Christi College at Cambridge University, given to the library by its patron, the Reformation Archbishop Matthew Parker. The manuscript includes several illustrations, including this portrait of St. Luke enthroned, surrounded by scenes from his gospels, and watched over by his attribute, a bull. The illustrations are magnificent, certainly, but it is the text of the Augustan gospels that was critically important as it brought the Gospels to Britain and served as a model for other great Gospel books of the early medieval period. These early Gospel books are massive, as much as two feet high. They are not the sort of books meant for cozying up in a comfy chair on a rainy afternoon. These are books for procession, for display and veneration, to be read from aloud in church from a lectern by a priest or another officiant. Literacy during this period was primarily the domain of monks and nuns, priests and confessors, and reading was usually allowed, precisely because most members of a church congregation would have been illiterate. In early books like the St. Augustine Gospels, 
Chapter and verse divisions did not yet exist. Instead, the text is written in logical phrases, a format known as percola et commata, or as manuscript scholar Christopher de Hamel puts it, by pauses and clauses, with line divisions indicating where a reader would logically pause for breath or effect. During the early Middle Ages, the New Testament was almost always circulated in a volume separate from the Pentateuch, Prophets, Psalter, and other Hebraic books. A manuscript of the whole Bible, rare but not unheard of in the early Middle Ages, is called a pandect, from the Greek word meaning a book of everything. The earliest surviving complete pandect is this enormous book, the Codex Amiatinus, written around the year 730. It is gigantic, nearly two feet high, and comprised of more than a thousand pages. Although it now resides in the Laurentian Library in Florence, Italy, it was written in northern England in the great abbey complex of Wearmouth Gero. The evidence suggests it was brought to Italy from England by a group of monks who were accompanying their abbot on a journey to Rome, where this manuscript was to have been a gift to the Pope. The abbot died en route, and rather than face the long and difficult journey back to England, the monks apparently gave up and lived out their years in the small abbey of San Salvatore on Monte Amiata outside Florence, from whence the manuscript gets its name. The journey of the Codex Amiatinus from the British Isles south to Italy was thus exactly the opposite of the road taken by the earlier Augustan Gospels, which traveled from the south to the north. Amiatinus is one of the earliest manuscripts known to have been produced in the British Isles and is thus extremely important as a textual and art historical witness. The manuscript begins with this quite famous full page illustration of a saint sitting with his feet resting on a low stool, writing in a book open on his lap, presumably writing words of prophecy. The two lines of text at the top of the page identify him, in fact, as the Old Testament prophet Ezra. There are several really striking features of this image. First, take a look at that massive bookcase open behind him. Don't ever let, this is another preconception I'm going to bust tonight. Don't ever let anyone tell you that Durer invented perspective. <laughs> art, don't let anyone tell you that artists in the Middle Ages didn't understand perspective or three-dimensionality, because obviously they did. That bookcase has depth, and it has heft. The books of the case are stored horizontally rather than upright, which is how books were, in fact, typically shelved during this period. Ezra's book is open on his lap for writing rather than resting on a desk. And he is shown as right-handed, as scribes always were. If you were born left-handed, you would have been forced to use your right hand instead. The text begins with this extraordinary image, gold letters written on purple-stained parchment, purple being even then the color of luxury and authority. About three quarters of the way through the manuscript, we find another magnificent full-page illustration this one of Christ enthroned in majesty, suspended in the firmament with flanking angels. In the corners, the four evangelists are illustrated with their saintly attributes. Matthew with an angel, John with an eagle, Luke with a, uh, Luke with a winged bull, and Mark with a winged lion. These attributes recur throughout biblical illustrations, and we will encounter them on nearly every stage of our journey today. The script and text and illustrations of these great early Bibles, such as Amiatinus and the Augustan Gospels, had a major influence on the next generation of biblical manuscripts, among them some of the most famous manuscripts in the world, such as the late 8th century Book of Kells from Ireland, itself a gospel book. And there is a facsimile of the Book of Kells right outside for you to look at after uh, the lecture. These great books add a distinctly Celtic aesthetic to the Bible, with their magnificent fractal-like carpet pages and knotwork, incorporating elements from stone carving and metalwork. The incredible intricacy and detail make some of the pages almost illegible. This book was about looking and venerating, not necessarily about reading. Oaths were taken on it, legal documents signed with the book itself as a witness. 
to the Gospels. The Book of Kells adds St. Jerome's index of people and places of the Bible, as well as a series of canon tables, charts that identify places where the various Gospel narratives correspond. These additional sections help make the Bible a reference work, allowing preachers and theologians to mine the text for their sermons and commentary. Later innovations, such as the division of the text into chapter and verse, as well as visual cues, will make the Bible even easier to access and navigate. In the seventh and the eighth centuries, missionaries from Irish and English monasteries traveled to the European continent to establish monastic communities. New monasteries need books, liturgical books, theological treatises, and Bibles, and so they brought manuscripts with them. As the new monasteries became self-sustaining, they established scriptoria and began copying their own manuscripts. At this point, these scribes and artists begin to incorporate their own local artistic and paleographical flavors, paleography meaning script, establishing distinctive styles of script and illumination. These localized styles went so far as to include different versions of the very alphabet, by which I mean the letter forms. These scribes are all using the same 26-letter Latin alphabet, but the appearance of the letters could be quite different from one place to the next. When Charlemagne was crowned King of France and, in the year 800, Holy Roman Emperor, he needed to unite his empire. One of the most pressing problems he faced was that this variety of writing styles used across the realm made communication exceedingly difficult since letter writers at one end of the empire might not even be able to read what was being written by someone at the other end. This made Charlemagne's task of unifying his empire particularly challenging. And of course, it is also extremely challenging for modern scholars to read these things. You can probably do it, but the rest of us can't. He can do it. <laughs> With the help of a scholar named Alcuin, shown here uh, in a portrait from the 12th century. Charlemagne standardized the alphabet from this mess, difficult, to this. The direct ancestor of the familiar letter forms that we still use today, known as Caroline or Carolingian script. Now that's worth repeating. The shape of these letters, you can draw a direct line from that to Times New Roman font. It is a direct descendant of the letter forms invented by Charlemagne's buddy Alcuin more than a thousand years ago. And that's pretty outstanding as far as having an impact uh, over the course of a thousand years. So under Alcuin's direction, scribes at the Abbey of St. Martin of Tours perfected this graceful and legible script and copied dozens of giant Bibles using the new style. These Bibles were shipped to every part of Charlemagne's realm, and monks in these scriptoria were instructed to learn the new lettering by copying these great Bibles. As part of this standardization, the format, Percola et Comata, was replaced by paragraphs marked uh, with initials in color. And the elaborate carpet pages and complex opening cartouches were superseded by a descending hierarchy of large initial, followed by capital letters, slightly smaller, and then finally leading the reader into the primary text. This format, developed more than a thousand years ago, is still the one that book designers use today. Bibles weren't only made for monks, of course. The late 10th century Gospels of Holy Roman Emperor Otto III is clearly a manuscript made for royalty. From its jewel-encrusted binding to its elaborate carpet pages to full-page miniatures covered with heavy, glittering gold leaf. This portrait of a wild-eyed Saint Luke enraptured by a vision, his bowl above and his lap covered with books is a personal favorite of mine. Innovations in the 12th century make the Bible even more navigable for preachers and theologians who found themselves increasingly in need of an efficient way to locate particular phrases and paragraphs to help make their rhetorical points. This elaborate 12th century masterpiece known as the Winchester Bible 
includes a series of prologues before each book of the Bible, some of which are attributed to St. Jerome himself. Each prologue in each book begins with what is called an inhabited or historiated initial, within which are illustrated scenes from the book they introduce. The initials thus do double duty as illustrations and letters. That descending hierarchy of script, including additional elaboration in the form of alternating use of color, leads the reader from the initial to the opening words and into the body of the text. The elaborate rubric above this initial, the one literally right above it where it's alternating blue and green and red, takes a little bit of effort to decode. It says, Incipit liber baruch natarii Jeremiah prophetai. Here begins the book of Baruch, scribe of Jeremiah. The prophet, the prophet Baruch is sometimes referred to as having been the amanuensis or secretary of the prophet Jeremiah. The first letter of the text, this carnivalesque H, has been cleverly divided into two registers, which taken together depict the third verse of the book of Baruch, which reads, Baruch read the text of this book aloud to Jeconia, son of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, and to all the people who had come to hear the reading. So here we see Baruch sitting in the upper left corner with his finger marking his place in the book, reading aloud to the enthroned King Jeconia, who is crowned uh, and unfortunately leaning on his arm looks a little bit bored. <laughs> the crossbar of the H is the floor of this royal chamber. And below it, we see the people gathered in a castle courtyard to listen to Baruch read his prophecy. Almost any letter of the alphabet can be used this way. And in this particular manuscript, they are, delightfully so. In this letter R, the prophet Jeremiah is shown below, prophesying, his words recorded on an unfurled scroll, like a speech bubble in a comic book, inspired by the vision of Christ in the register above. This late 12th century example adds another element to the increasingly complex page layout of Bibles, extensive commentary in the margins, and even written between the lines. This particular image is the beginning of Paul's epistle to the Romans. It is a particular feature of the epistles that every one of them in Latin begins with the letter P, Paulus. A tradition developed whereby even in Bibles that are minimally illustrated, each of these epistolary P's is historiated with a depiction of Paul preaching or delivering his epistle. In this case, we actually have three different scenes from Paul's life. At the top of the P, inside the bowl, Paul is shown preaching to the Romans, inspired by the Holy Spirit in the form of the dove descending from above in the middle. In the center of the stem of the letter, the artist has used the vertical constraints to show Paul being lowered in a basket over the walls of Cyprus as he tries to escape the Romans who are searching for him. Finally, at the bottom, we see the end of the story as Paul is about to be beheaded by a sword-wielding Roman soldier. In this case, the artist has both filled the empty space in the letter as well as using the shape of its solid form to frame the images. This is a rather creative way of using letter forms that don't surround empty space, turning them into decorative elements that do double duty as initials and illustrations. If we go back to the Winchester Bible, we will see an example where this artist does the same thing, exemplifying a tradition that would last for centuries. The depiction of scenes from the book of Genesis in roundels within the vertical bounds of the first letter of the first book of the Bible, the eye of in principio, in the beginning. The in principio initial of the Winchester Bible is acknowledged as a medieval masterpiece, so much so that its artist is known as the master of the Genesis initial. These seven roundels take us on a narrative journey from creation through the Old and New Testaments all the way to redemption. The multicolored rubric begins in Kippet Liber Genesis, the reader then must turn to the spectacular full-length multi-register stack of roundels within the letter I before continuing with N, Principio Creavit Deus Caelum et Terram, in the beginning God created heaven and earth. The text then continues with the Bible's fine and legible bookhand. 
But let's take a moment and walk through these beautiful roundels. At the top, we see God drawing Eve from Adam's side as he sleeps. I find the musculature of these figures to be particularly uh, impressive. Next, we encounter the Ark afloat. Noah, accompanied by his family, is reaching through an open window to welcome back the empty-beaked dove. The waters, after all, have not receded. And floating in the depths, we can actually make out the bodies of those left behind. At the left, a raven waits for the scavenging still to come once the waters recede. Third is the sacrifice of Isaac. Abraham, obviously the man with the sword, holds Isaac in place on the altar with his left hand, preparing to sacrifice him with the sword in his right. An angel holds back the deadly sword blow with his left hand, and with his right hand he gestures towards the scapegoat that is to be offered in Isaac's stead. In the fourth position, Moses stands on an ethereal cloud-like Mount Sinai, his arms outstretched towards God, who offers him the tablets of the Ten Commandments. Next, Samuel anoints and crowns David as king. Here, a prefigurement of Christ as king. The nativity is next. The infant snugly swaddled beneath the gaze of an ass and a bull as Joseph looks on and the virgin reclines after her labors. The series culminates with the end of days as Christ sits in judgment. As we look at the entire page again, we can observe the penultimate step towards easy reference of biblical passages. Here in the 12th century, the addition of standardized chapter numbers. There it is. More typical and less masterly are the in principio initials such as these, depicting the seven days of creation at one end of the story and the crucifixion at the other. Even if there is no other illumination in a particular Bible, you can count on finding an extended, an extended historiated initial I at the beginning of the book of Genesis. Some of these are so elaborate that they almost don't look like the letter I anymore. But they do indeed represent the beginning of the beginning. In this late 12th century manuscript from Troyes in France, the Genesis medallions are beautifully abstract and wonderfully evocative of the verses they illustrate. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth, and the earth was without form and void, and darkness was on the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God, here a dove, moved upon the face of the waters. Day two, and God said, let there be firmament in the midst of the waters, and let it divide the waters from the waters. And God made the firmament, and divided the waters, here you see God's hand doing the dividing, which were under the firmament from the waters which were above the firmament, and it was so. Day three, and God said, let the earth bring forth grass, the herb yielding seed, and the fruit tree yielding fruit after his kind, whose seed is in itself upon the earth, and it was so. Day four, and God said, let there be lights in the firmament of the heaven, to, decide, to divide day from night. And God made two great lights, the greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night, and he made the stars also. Day five, and God said, let the waters bring forth abundantly the moving creatures that hath life and the fowl that may fly above the earth in the open firmament of heaven. Day six, and God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. So God created man in his own image, and the image of God created he him. Male and female, he created them. It is worth noting that in this very unusual depiction of the creation of Eve from Adam's side, she is only partially formed, being drawn from Adam as unformed clay to be molded by God. These Genesis initials persist in handwritten Bibles, even as the format and function of the holy book adapted to changing social structures. In the 13th century, literacy was on the rise as universities were established in places like Oxford and Paris and Venice. More and more people outside of the clergy and nobles were becoming educated and were learning to read. More and more people need and want their own books. 
including their own personal Bibles. And so the Bible shrinks. Transitioning from the giant processional ceremonial books displayed on church lecterns to small books written in a script so minuscule as to be nearly illegible. These books are for individual use and are eminently portable, often stored in wrappings with a knot at one end for easy carriage or to be tucked into a sash at the waist, known as girdle bindings. Mass produced by the thousands in France, these little books are known as Paris Bibles, although they weren't all made in Paris. They're about this big. As small as they are, in this case, only six inches high and four inches across, many are heavily illustrated with miniature, jewel-like historiated initials created with tiny horsehair brushes by artists of extraordinary skill. Even if you couldn't read Latin, you could study these images and meditate on the contents of the Bible. And so Bibles become personal, portable objects for individuals to hold and venerate and examine and read. This is a seismic transformation. Maybe you don't need a priest or a clergyman to interpret the Bible for you. Maybe you could read it yourself. You can draw a straight line from these small personal Bibles to the next development. People start to ask a logical, if radical, question. If I can own a Bible, and I can read the Bible in Latin in my house, why can't I read it in my spoken language? Why can't I read the Bible in English, or German, or Dutch, or French, or Italian, or Spanish? This notion was not only radical, it was downright heretical. The text of the Latin Bible was sacred, not populist. It was dangerous enough to allow people to own their own little Bibles. What might happen if they could actually read the Bible in the vernacular? This idea was a huge threat to the power of the clergy in late medieval life. That threat became real when the Bible was translated into Middle English in 1384 in a series of translations made under the direction of John Wycliffe. Wycliffe opposed the privileged status of the clergy and believed that by making the Bible available to the common folk in their own language, he could disrupt the church's power struggle. While rich folks could commission elaborate copies of the Wycliffeite Bible, many of the surviving manuscripts are humble books made for the common folk, inexpensive and accessible. But even in a humble copy, the Genesis initial is still big and bright, as in this manuscript, currently at Oxford University's Bodleian Library. Here is how the first few verses of the book of Genesis sounded when they were heard in English for the very first time 633 years ago. In the beginning, a god mad of nocht, a habena and ertha, for salt of the ertha was he deadled and vaida, and a knesis wadren on the fast of depta, and the spirit of the Lord was badren on the watress, and God sighed and left a be mad, and left a was mad. God said, Light be made, and light was made. It's a direct order. I love that. Wycliffe's Lollard followers, persecuted, arrested, and often executed, started a populist tide that would culminate in the Protestant Revolution. Did I say revolution? I meant reformation. <laughs> it was a revolution. The tradition of writing the Bible by hand came to an end soon after Johannes Gutenberg invented the printing press and produced his famous two-volume Latin Bible in the 1450s. But even as fewer handwritten Bibles were produced, printed books continued to be hand-illuminated, like this particular Gutenberg Bible, well into the 16th century. Hiring illuminator was expensive, however, and by the late 16th century, woodcuts and engravings had all but replaced hand illumination. The mechanical revolution was complete. Let's stop and take a breath and just think about how far we've come in 40 minutes. We've covered the development of the Latin Bible from Jerome all the way to Gutenberg, a journey of more than a thousand years. 
Although other faiths continued to write the Bible by hand, such as Ethiopic and Coptic Bibles or Jewish Torah scrolls, the Catholic Bible would be transmitted in print almost exclusively for the next 550 years. Fast forward to the late 20th century. In the small town of Collegeville, Minnesota, the Benedictine monks of St. John's Abbey live and work according to the ancient rule of St. Benedict, worshiping in a church that is utterly modern. They are the stewards of the Hill Museum and Manuscript Library, or Himmel to those of us who know this beloved institution. Himmel was established in the 1960s with the mission to preserve European monastic manuscript collections, initially by photographing them onto microfilm. Today, however, their mission is truly urgent, as their collaborators on the ground race against the likes of ISIS to preserve early Christian libraries in Syria and other high-risk areas. But back in the summer of 1998, the collection was focused on monastic collections in Austria and Germany. That summer, a young scholar working on her first book spent two weeks at the library studying Austrian manuscripts on microfilm. But an even more momentous event than my research trip to Himmel, if you can believe that, occurred that year. That was the year that the St. John's Bible was commissioned, the first great handwritten Bible to grace the Western world in five centuries. The scribe of the Bible, Donald Jackson, had dreamed of creating a hand-illuminated Bible ever since he was a child in Wales. At St. John's University, a committee of artists, medievalists, theologians, biblical scholars, and art historians, known as the Committee on Illumination and Text, reflected carefully on each of the seven volumes before they were written. How would they be illuminated? Which verses would they emphasize in different script and in different colors? Like their monastic predecessors, the artisans who worked on the St. John's Bible wrote with feather quills on calfskin, illuminating the pages with gold and colors. The majestic and stunning volumes completed in 2007 show the influence of medieval Bibles in their format, iconography, script, and layout, but with an entirely modern interpretive framework, bringing to new generations an increased appreciation of these inspirational words and images. Thank you. All right. So Lisa's willing to answer some questions. We have two people that can bring a microphone to you. I'll let you moderate. Are you okay? Sure. Okay. Yeah. Anyone have any questions? Anything they want to know more about? No questions at all? I've answered everything. I've told you everything you could ever want to know. Okay. Anyone? No? Oh, yeah. Sorry. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So the, the Paris Bibles... Um, she was asking about the, the manufacture of the Paris Bibles. So those are, yes, those are manuscripts. They're all made by hand in the 13th century. So this is way before printing. This is 200 years before printing was in, developed. And so when you think about how small they are, they're literally this big. That there's probably a leaf. There are several leaves outside. In fact, you'll be able to see there are real live manuscript pages outside um, that you can look at afterwards. Yes. And there are some of these Paris Bibles, so you'll be able to see exactly how tiny they are in real life. They are minuscule. They are 50 lines of text written on a page this big. I don't know how anyone could write them, much less read them. Uh, they did have magnifying glasses. Magnifiers did exist at the time, so perhaps that was how they did it. But they are really uh, extraordinary in the, their craftsmanship precisely because they are so minuscule. I mean, how are you going to shrink the entire Bible down into something portable? They're really thick, like a, a real one of these Bibles. So the pages are like this, but they're like this thick. They're like bricks. I don't know how, you know, they're said to be portable, but it's not like you could put it in your pocket and carry it around with you. But uh, yes, they are. To answer, the short answer is yes, they're made entirely by hand. So one of the things that I should have mentioned, that's a good question. Thank you. She's asking who made them. By the time we get 
to the universities, when universities start to develop. And I'm sorry that I left this out because it's extremely important, so I'm glad you asked. Book production transitions from the monasteries to professional workshops. So while monks are still making books, you also have, for example, like with these Paris Bibles, workshops. Uh, and the ones in Paris were actually right near Notre Dame on the, on the island where Notre Dame is, was where all the booksellers were. And they had professional scribes sitting there in their workshops just cranking out these Bibles day after day uh, by the hundreds, by the thousands. I mean, it was really incredibly popular. They were literally bestsellers and everyone had to have one. Uh, and so those were being made by professionals, not by, uh, not by monks at that point. Yes? Um, I'm wondering, you said that people in um, Scotland and Ireland weren't the Holy Right. So how did the tradition start where they suddenly were the ones who were the ones who were eliminating all these manuscripts and kind of leading the way and starting? Well, because they were the ones who, they, they were sacked by the Visigoths, you know? I mean, that's, that's really the reason, is that because they weren't part, they weren't ever really, they weren't incorporated into the Roman Empire, so they weren't part of the collapse of the Roman Empire. They just kept muddying along, as they had been doing before, uh, outside of the influence and outside of all of this turmoil that was happening as the Romans retreated and uh, things were kind of chaotic for a few hundred years on the continent and in the south of England. But way up there in the north, nobody was really paying attention and they were just sort of left to their own devices. So they could continue to do this work without interference from these, uh, these raiders and the, the, uh, the Goths and the Visigoths and these uh, tribes that were coming in and sowing such chaos uh, elsewhere. I saw another hand. Yes, sir. Yeah. In your studies of scripture, how much of an error factor? No from this handwritten generation to this So that's a really thorny and delicate question. Um, because it touches on theology and scripture, uh, and it, it's, it's complicated. And so there are, for example, uh, I believe it's, um, I believe it's Amiatinus where someone has gone through and made annotations early, very early about different readings where the old, the old Latin someone thought was better than Jerome's and as opposed to Jerome's, and they've kind of combined them and made choices about which translation they think is more accurate. And I'll, I'll give you one example that that is pretty important, which is the um, Aramaic term that Jerome translates as a virgin. In Aramaic is a little more uh, nuanced. It could mean a young, it could just mean a young woman. And so by making that choice, Jerome made, you know, was affiliating the story of Jesus' birth with the Isaiah prophecy, which is pretty clearly referring to a virgin will conceive and bear a son. So that's one example where you have theologians going back and, and sort of thinking about how the choices you make in the translation can impact um, the interpretation of the text and have major theological, major theological implications. Uh, here, you, sir. When did the separation in your chapters and verses take place? Was it all at one time? Or? Well, so uh, there is a, a theologian in England called, named Stephen Langdon who is traditionally credited with setting up the modern um, division into chapter and verse, and that was in the early 13th century. But we do see it earlier than that in the 12th century. Um, and, it, and so nobody really knows who was the first person to establish it. Although uh, Stephen Langdon, in, like I said, in the 13th century, made some particular decisions and choices that do get handed down as canonical. So, you know, sort of in the 13th century is when it, it really gets uh, set the way that we know it today. Sorry, say it again. Yes. 
Uh, yes. So these, these manuscripts, whether it's in a scriptoria or in a professional workshop, are produced uh, almost on an assembly line. So you have one person who's making the parchment. Well, go back even further. You've got somebody killing the cow and skinning it. Making parchment is a disgusting, messy business. Don't Google it. On You'll find videos on YouTube. It's disgusting. Uh, and so you've got some guy killing the pup's calf. You've got someone else skinning it and making the parchment. Someone else is making the ink. Someone else is making the colors, the scribe, the artist. Someone else is sewing it up and putting it in a binding. You know, so you, you have all these different people who uh, there, there, are, there are places where we, we can where we think scribe and artist are the same person, but that tends to be um, in earlier monastic manuscripts. So say, uh, like that portrait I showed you of Charlemagne and Alcuin, that was done by a, a 12th century monk in Austria who I wrote my dissertation about, which is why I like that image. Um, that's why I was at Hill. See, it all comes back around. Uh, and so that, that image was almost certainly also the, the scribe and the artist were the same person. But it's typically different people uh, doing all the different pieces. And certainly when you get to the professional workshops, you, you have all different people specializing in different parts of, uh, of bookmaking. I thought I saw another hand. Yes? Is there any information regarding how much time was required to um, not, not really specifically, not in the, in the earlier period. We can guess, you know, I mean, well, think about how long it took him to do the St. John's Bible. It took 10 years, you know, to do those seven volumes. Wouldn't necessarily have taken 10 years, but uh, it, you know, if you think about, well, so Amiotinus, a thousand pages. For one thing, that's a lot of animals. So pages are this big. You know, that could be 500 animals that gave their lives to make the skins for that book. So there's those resources. There's all the ink. There's the quills. There's the, the, the person power. It, it was, it, that, that book probably took a year. You know, if you think, imagine how long it would take you to write the entire Bible just by yourself, you know. Um, we do have more certain records in the professional workshops because they were paid by the page or, you know, so we do have a sense of, for those, how long it might have taken. And so one of those little Bibles, it, it could take weeks and weeks because you had multiple people working on it. But it was still, uh, 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 it still was a, a great, a, a huge uh, effort. Well, my um, question kind of relates to what you said about the amount of time it takes. I had um, come across a book Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. My, my hand hurts. Give me some wine. Don't touch my book. Sure. Yeah, those are great. So there's a lot of examples of, well, there are a few different styles. So of uh, monks at the end of their labor, after they've written the entire book, and it's been months and months they've been working on it, they might write something like, it's really cold, my hand hurts, please, God, give me some wine, or it's too dark in here, I can't see a thing, or if you touch this, may you be cursed for eternity, don't steal my book, don't touch this book. Uh, you know, there's a lot of those, and some of them are really hysterical, the, the, the punishments that they're going to bring down on your head if you so much as touch this book. Uh, you know, I've seen, there's one where, it's, um, uh, again, this is my, my Austrian monk, uh, who wrote, he, he was the librarian at the, this abbey, and he wrote a whole list of the books that they had. And at the top, he said, if anyone takes any books from my library, I will strike you from the book of the living. <laughs> so the book where the monks wrote their names when they professed, he would strike them from it. He would literally delete you if you touched his books. So there are, there are quite a lot of examples, and some of them are, are, are pretty entertaining. But it makes you realize just how much they cared about these books, how much they put into them, that they, you know, that they left these sort of threatening notes in the back. Uh, not just, this is my book, it belongs to me, but I worked really hard on this. So hands off. Yeah. Yes, sir. Yes. Is what you're saying that the, the early Bibles were actually chained to the desk? Yes. Yep. Yeah. Yep. So uh, uh, not all of them, but many of them were. So 
uh, they would have, and, and there are some examples that survive today. There, there are some examples of, of medieval chained libraries that still exist, that where the books are still, in fact, chained to the lecterns or chained to the shelves. You would have the binding, and at the top of the binding, you would have a little metal uh, hasp to which a chain would be attached, and then it would be chained to the shelf. So you would have to, it would, you know, it's like a, the, the reference library, uh, reference books that aren't, that don't circulate. You know, these were not circulating libraries, and the books were valuable. The books were, they needed them, especially liturgical books and Bibles. You know, the monks couldn't, couldn't pray without them. And so the books would be attached so that no one could steal them. Yeah. In the back, yes. Was there any evidence of uh, orders of women preparing books? Definitely, yeah. Um, there, are, there are plenty of uh, examples where we know uh, of scriptoria in nunneries where uh, the women were the artists. There are some women, you're not supposed to, technically you weren't really supposed to sign your name to your work because you're not supposed to be doing it for your own credit. You're, you're you know, in a monastic scriptoria. You're creating these books for the glory of God and for your abbey, not so that people will know that you are the great artist or the great scribe. But there are places where people have snuck their name into a margin or hidden it in an initial. Uh, there's a manuscript at the Walters Art Museum, I believe, where uh, the name of the, uh, the nun, uh, she's, she's drawn the letter Q where she is the crossbar of the Q. She's drawn a portrait of herself sort of clinging to the, the circle of the Q and it says Clarissa on it. So we know her name. And there are other examples of that where we, where we have particular, uh, particular names, but there were definitely women who were uh, engaging in book production who were scribes and, and artists. Yes. Mm -hmm. So it depends. So sometimes a manuscript would be copied and there would be lots of space left in the margins. And that would be specifically so that an owner could put in little marginal things, little pointing hands saying, hey, look at this little notes about, uh, about things that they thought were particularly interesting. So that was one way that that happened. Another was if the manuscript was specifically designed to have marginal commentary, somebody's uh, commentary on uh, the particular text. So the, the example I showed you uh, where it was Paul's, um, uh, the epistle to the Romans, that was a very specific text that was probably copied at the same time as the book. So the, the, this Bible was intended to have that marginal commentary. So it's, it, it worked both ways. Yes, sir. I'm curious about the abbreviations that you would encounter mm. dealing with the um, Do these abbreviations change from location to location, or are they standard no matter where you are? Well, so if you look at this manuscript right here, there are no abbreviations. Right? I mean, if you look at that, the, the, what, what he's referring to, manuscript scholar that he is, uh, because parchment is really valuable and scribal time is a valuable resource, scribes start abbreviating letters, abbreviating words. And there are actually resources that we can use uh, to unscramble those abbreviations. But in these earlier manuscripts, they're not really thinking that way yet. They're, they don't abbreviate words at all. And there isn't even any punctuation. You know, punctuation actually develops as a way to help people who are reading out loud, uh, to give them a visual cue to when you're supposed to stop, when do you take a breath. If it's a question mark, that tells you when you read it aloud, you have to raise your voice at the end. So those, you know, so that was the, that was why punctuation was invented, was to help you read things out loud. And at the same time, as book production rolls along and through the monastic period, so starting in, say, you know, like, uh, you know, like the eighth century, maybe you start seeing um, words being abbreviated. And I suspect, I'm talking off the cuff here, I don't know for sure, but I, I suspect that has to do with the ramping up of monastic book production as they're trying to write more books. And so they start abbreviating so that they can do the job faster. I don't know that for a fact, but I'm guessing. Yeah, exactly, and it, it takes less space, you use less parchment, uh, and so you save money on your cows and sheep. Yes, sir. 
The time of the Gutenberg uh, press yeah. in the German Bible, was that uh, written in German, handwriting at that time? So the uh, Gutenberg was, um, the Gutenberg Bible is in Latin. It is in Latin, but at the same time as Gutenberg was printing his Latin Bible, you were seeing, you started to see Bibles being uh, both handwritten and printed in spoken languages, in the vernacular languages. Uh, but Gutenberg, I believe, only printed in Latin. Don't quote me on that. I don't know that for sure. We'd have to ask the internet. Is that true? Yeah, I think Gutenberg only worked in Latin, but there were printers in the 1500s who were printing things in French and were printing in German and, and, other, uh, and other languages. So what kind of modern Gutenberg to start changing? Uh, a little bit, uh, slightly later, right? When what's Martin Luther's dates? That's right. We're, we just we're we're at the 500th anniversary right now, right? So there we go. So we can work our way backwards. So we're in the, you know, the the 16th century. So right, you know, when all of this is going on. Yeah. Well, it has to depend on my question too, because you did bring up the fact that that was all right to try to keep translation. Yeah. Yeah. So my question was, should we not be grateful to the on the 23rd for allowing everyone to have the translated Bible in their own language? Is that due to his leadership, do you suppose? Because I remember that it was a big event that we did all of the time. We could read the French Bible in English. Before that, was always a last. Right. Well, I mean, I, I'm, I'm, I don't, I'm not a, an expert in modern Catholicism, so I, I couldn't answer that question. Everyone in this room probably knows better than I do who lived through that. My, my personal feeling is, yeah, I'm, I'm all for making the text uh, accessible and, and comprehensible. I do love it in Latin, I have to say. I really like Latin. I like singing Latin liturgy, but I also appreciate the importance of, uh, of everyone understanding what it is they're praying and what it is they're reading. I think that's extremely important. Yeah. Yes? So with the same question, Yep. So, um, I wonder, let me, I could go back. Hold on, let me just flip backwards and I'll show you. Yeah, sorry. So she was asking about, so if we go back to, let's go back, I gotta go back a little bit. We gotta flip through those. Going back, back, back. More, more. There we go. Okay, so when we look at that, so that is, is sort of the first generation of Carolingian script. So that's like classic Alcuin-inspired text. But there are still letter forms that are kind of unfamiliar to us. Like there's no round S, for example. There's only that long S that you see in kind of antique-looking printing. Uh, round S, you could actually write a whole book about the letter S in the Middle Ages. I find it really, really interesting, but I'm a paleography nerd. But I think the letter S is really fascinating. But if you look in the upper right corner there, um, at that uh, Gottschalk is the name of the artist, so let's go back there, that's 12th century. And you know, by the time you get to sort of Romanesque, we're, you know, we've got the round S, we've got more, more familiar letter forms. You know? So it sort of progresses kind of through the 11th century and into the, into the 12th century. I thought I saw another hand. Yeah. Mm, okay, so if we go back, let's see if we can observe that. So there's Kells. Let's go back to a text page. All right, so there's Amiotinus. There's no punctuation there. That is just the, the, the division of the lines tell you, right? And so that's the late sixth, uh, the seventh century. So if we move into, so there's that. If we move, let's get past that. I don't know if I even had a good text page for the book of Kells. But Kells, I believe, does not have punctuation either. Uh, and that, or, oh, God only knows what that is. No, that doesn't have any punctuation. Uh, you know, so here we are in the 12th century, and we're, we, we have real punctuation by the time we get to the 12th century. But it starts to develop in kind of the 10th century, sort of the 9th, 10th century, in the Caroline era. And by the time you get to the Romanesque period, which this is in the 12th century, you have consistently used punctuation. So in this manuscript, which is not a Bible, I just throw it in there because I like this portrait of Charlemagne and Alcuin, um, we have real punctuation. We have periods. You've got semicolons. You might even have a question mark somewhere. 
So that, you know, that's like real punctuation. There's a great book about the history of punctuation called Eat, Shoots, and Leaves that I really recommend if you haven't read it. It's brilliant. It's really a terrific book. I would also, just as long as I'm recommending books, if you're interested in medieval manuscripts, the, the greatest manuscript scholar in the world is a gentleman named Christopher de Hamel, uh, who lives in England. And he has just published a book. He published it in England last year. It just came out in North America called Meetings with Remarkable Manuscripts. And it's about his personal encounters with the Codex Amiotinus and the St. Augustine Gospels, the Book of Kells, which he got to sit down and just sort of page through one day uh, because he's Christopher de Hamel. I really recommend it. Uh, he's a wonderful writer. It's got lots of pictures and really interesting stories about what it's like to work with this kind of material. Any more questions? Yeah. Well, so in the it it varies over the course of of the thousand years, but initially they they need them for for the use of the abbey. So they have to have liturgical books. They need they need uh, breviaries. They need graduals, they need evangelaries, they need lectionaries, they need psalters, they need all these different kinds of books in order to conduct their services every day. You know, they're praying the hours eight times a day, they've got mass once a day, they've got all these special rituals and processions and all these things. Uh, you know, they need a ritual for baptism, they need a ritual for burials. So they've got all these different books and they have to make them in-house because there's, no there's no other way to get them. Uh, as you get a little bit later on, you start to find some places, for example, there's a, a nunnery in, um, in Harlem, in uh, Holland, that was making books to sell as a way to raise money. And that's much later, that's in the 15th century. So as you get a little further along, uh, you do find uh, monks and nuns making books to sell to the outside world because they're competing with these professional scriptoria uh, for business, as it were. So it's sort of, you, you get both of those. Um, models. Yes, sir. The Hebrew Bible. Yes. In the Old Testament. Yes. Was there a parallel development among the Jews as there was among the Christians? No. Uh, and I will tell you why. If we, let's jump ahead and look at that Torah scroll for a second. Sorry. Hang on. We'll get there. All right. We're going to look at that again. We're going to look at that again. Keep going. Keep going. Keep going. Keep going. Nope. There we go. Okay. So there's a Torah at the top. The thing about Torahs is there, it is almost impossible to tell how old a Torah is by looking at it. I can tell you how old a Latin manuscript is just by looking at it, by looking at the style of the handwriting. That's what I'm trained to do. By looking at the handwriting and the illumination, I can tell you this manuscript is from the early 14th century. That one's from the 8th century. That's, that's what I do. Torah scrolls look exactly the same by Jewish law. They have to. You have to copy it exactly the same. If you make one mistake, you've got to burn it and start over. And so the, the, there is no similar development in uh, the Hebrew Bible. It's always written in a scroll, and the letters, the shape of the letters, the words have to be exactly the same as the one that you're copying from. So it's extreme. Hebrew paleography is a whole different ballgame from uh, Latin paleography. Yep, exactly the same. Yeah, always. You can tell if something is Sephardic versus Ashkenazic from kind of the style, but in general, it's, uh, you have to copy it exactly the same as the uh, exemplar that you're working from. Do we have time for another one? Oh, okay, where? Uh, who hasn't asked a question yet? There. <laughs> Is it copied then from the original? Well, I mean, I suppose eventually. I mean, there are thousands of Torah scrolls in the world right now. Thousands and thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands. I have no idea how many Torah scrolls there are in the world. Uh, and I suppose if you trace them all back 2,000 years, they would go back to, to the original and original. I, I couldn't tell you. Certainly, we don't have a whole Torah that goes back that far. We have little bits, 
you know, the Dead Sea Scrolls, for example, but, uh, and other, uh, other little Geniza fragments. But there's, you know, there's no whole text of the Hebrew Bible that, that it survives. Well, that's what you were supposed to do. Um, but you, at the earliest, you know, see, I wouldn't, I wouldn't trust myself to get this right. But my, my understanding is that the, the oldest known scrolls of the Hebrew Torah are only from maybe the 10th or 11th century. They don't go back very far. There's just, they don't, there's nothing that survives. So it's extremely difficult to, you know, it's all speculation. We, we really have no way to, to trace it back any further than that because the, the manuscripts just don't survive. Yeah. Yep. It 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 makes uh, it makes the job of someone who is cataloging the manuscript really hard. Is that what you're getting at? No, that, that seems quite plausible to me. Uh, we certainly have examples. So, for example, I've seen manuscripts where the style of the script, I would swear, is French, but the illumination is clearly Italian, like you could bet your life on it. And so then you're stuck with, well, is this an Italian artist working in France? Is it a French scribe who traveled to Italy? So there are all sorts of, there are definitely things like that happening where people moved around and settled somewhere else and they learned a new style or they didn't. Uh, so you do see those kind of um, uh, combinations happening that, that definitely throw a curveball into the scholarship. Uh, and you have to kind of think outside the box and start thinking about different scenarios and what, what might have been possible. I'm wondering about the Byzantine world and the Mm-hmm. Definitely. So I, I didn't really talk about uh, Byzantium at all because, number one, that is not my field. I, I really don't. I, I wouldn't feel confident um, talking about that, but, but I do know that artistically, it's a whole different tradition. And of course, writing in Greek is a whole different tradition. You know, the, Sept, the, the uh, Septuagint and so on is a whole different tradition of biblical scholarship. Uh, and I really wouldn't be, uh, I, I wouldn't want to speculate because I, I, uh, I don't study Greek manuscripts. So I, I'm afraid I, I, I couldn't answer that. Maybe someone else in the room who, who can answer that question, but I'm sorry. All right. Thank you all so much. So I'd like to invite forward Dr. Stephen Minarski, co-director of Medieval Studies and a member of our history part, department to formally thank our speaker. So it's my great pleasure, as Professor Vanine said, to thank Dr. Lisa Fagan Davis on behalf of the university uh, for providing us with a delightfully illuminated talk that took us from Jerome to Gutenberg to Minnesota's Himmel and on to the St. John's Bible. And, and her talk did a wonderful job of placing the St. John's Bible in its very long and rich historical context. Would you please join me in giving her a very warm Waterloo welcome? And thank her. <laughs> And now, do please join us outside. We have many of the students from the Medieval Dragon Lab uh, representing our Medieval Studies program who will show you some original documents. If you'd like to hold a real page from a medieval book, then we've brought some for you. And you can then cross the hall and see the St. John's Bible and connect history in your own, your own perception. Yeah. All right. Plugs for things that you can do. But I want to say a couple things before we leave and you, before you head out there and enjoy all, the, all that's out there for you. 
First of all, we send out regular emails about upcoming speakers. If you're not currently on our mailing list and you want to receive information about this lecture series, as well as other lectures and events taking place at St. Jerome's uh, over the year, please uh, make sure you can go to the welcome table and sign up and we can get you on our list. Every year, St. Jerome's University is pleased to be able to present a program of speakers to the community and make them available to you. Um, we are able to do this because of the generosity of many partners and supporters. If you would also like to support the lectures, there are some donation envelopes at the welcome table. And this evening, I want to extend our thanks in particular to the John Devlin family for the special fund that is helping to support tonight's lecture. There are a number of wonderful fairly traded products available for sale in the atrium by our social justice committee, so you might want to stock up for some stocking stuffers or such things. Our local independent bookseller, Wordsworth Books, is here again with us this evening, so you can visit their table. And again, as Stephen said, if you didn't get a chance on your way in, please visit the manuscripts that we have on exhibit. Um, and then I'm going to do my best. I'll uh, find some, I'll get over there and I'll open up the St. John's Bible and bring that out for you on the other side. So you can go from medieval to 21st century. The next lecture in Catholic experience is going to take place on Friday, December the 8th. And it is entitled, The Artist as Preacher, Sacred Art and the Eye of the Beholder. Father Eric Hollis from St. John's University will be here to help us consider the profound insights that artists such as calligraphers and illuminators can offer us, especially what the illuminations in the St. John's Bible communicate to us. The next day, Saturday, December the 9th, Father Hollis will be giving a pre-concert talk as part of the Handel's Messiah concert being presented by the Grand Philharmonic Choir. Illuminations from the St. John's Bible are going to be projected in the center in the square as the Messiah is being sung that evening. So you may want to visit the center in the square box office to purchase your tickets for this amazing event that's closing out our year with the St. John's Bible. The first of this year's Bridges lectures will take place Wednesday, November 22nd at 7.30 p.m. And the title of that lecture is Perfumery, the Art and Science of Smell. Luca Turin and Saskia Wilson-Brown are going to deal with the questions, what exactly is fragrance? And how might we discuss and theorize the sense of smell? So you can visit the Bridges Lectures website for more information of that upcoming lecture. And finally, I want to thank all of you for coming this evening. It's wonderful to have you with us as always, and thank you for the, all the ways in which you spread the word about our lectures and events. I look forward to seeing you back in December. For now, have a safe trip home, and good night. Thank you.